are live now. Hi, welcome to our screen share. Uh, we are currently live. It looks like there's a bunch of people here and asking questions. That is wonderful. Uh, I'm going to introduce people. Um, we're we're going to have four people on the webinar. Liz Bergeron, Beth Boist, Anitra Cass, and myself, Jack Haskell. This is going to be a pretty basic overview with a focus on last-minute preparation for the class of 2016, especially if you're northbound through hikers. We'll start with some introductions, then we'll get into the meaty details and ask questions at the end. On the right-hand side, if you are on the events page, which we have a link from pcta.org slash TV, you can log in to Google and ask questions right inside the webinar. Okay, thank you. Liz, take it away. All right, thanks, Jack. Hi, everybody. I'm Liz Bergeron. I'm the Executive Director and CEO of the Pacific Crest Trail Association. And it's really exciting to be able to talk with you today um, via this webinar. Wish we could see you all in person, but I guess this is the next best thing. So you're gonna, we're going to provide a lot of information today about your upcoming journey, and I hope that you learn a few things that you find useful. So at the Pacific Crest Trail Association, we work for, for you. We want to make sure that you all have a wonderful time out there. So we work to take care of the trail. And, and our work involves protecting the trail experience, not just the trail. Because we want you to be able to experience the trail as uh, whatever you want to experience, really. But, but, but things such as experiencing the trail as a refuge from the day-to-day -day activities of your everyday life. Uh, we want you to enjoy the freedom of being outdoors days on end that the trail brings. And also experience the physical challenge and the personal accomplishments that your hike will surely bring. The work that we do involves uh, recruiting volunteers to help take care of the trail and maintain the trail. Um, we monitor policies and activities that take place to ensure the trail's existence. And we provide trail information. Today is part of that trail information program, and you're going to learn a whole lot in the next hour. We also help buy land to permanently protect the trail. Uh, you may or may not know that you will be walking across some private property and our ultimate vision is to have a trail experience that includes um, land that is federally owned, public land. We want this to all be your land, uh, to eliminate those private gaps. So we do this in partnership with the Forest Service and in just a couple minutes I'm going to introduce Beth um, who represents the Forest Service, but before I do that, I just wanted to share my trail experience. So over the last 10 years, I've hiked 1,200 miles of the trail, and I've done it in sections. Um, I've met many, many through hikers, day hikers, and just had some incredible experiences as a section hiker, as a day hiker, or as a weekend backpacker. I love the work that I do uh, for the Pacific Crest Trail Association, and I'm so excited that all of you are embarking on this journey. This year I'll be hiking part of the trail in Oregon in August. I've got about a 100-mile section planned, and I hope to run into some of you and get to meet you in person uh, when I'm out there this summer. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Beth Boist. Uh, Beth is the PCT program manager with the Forest Service, and we are so fortunate to have somebody like Beth in this important position. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Hello, everyone. I am so sorry that I don't get to see you at the Southern Terminus. I think that the trip that you're about to embark on is truly a remarkable adventure. It's one that it can be transformative in terms of life and experience. And um, it really is all about opportunity and what you choose to make of it. So 
how wonderful to have that opportunity. One of the really fabulous things about our public lands is that Congress was wise enough to set aside this trail to be protected for uh, these long distance journeys. And so I think that as you embark, you're really having this opportunity to benefit from the wise conservation um, efforts from the 60s and even before then. So I work for the U.S. Forest Service. My job is pretty narrow. I'm only, the only thing I have to work on is the Pacific Crest Trail. But as you all know, it's 2,650 miles long, goes from Mexico to Canada, and there's a whole lot of opportunity there. 25 national forests, seven national, seven BLM units, six national parks, and five California state parks. So you have a lot of different lands that you'll be walking to, and as Liz said, uh, you will also be walking through private land. So as we um, talk today, please know that we're wanting you to be very successful in your journey, and we want you to take care of these places that you're traveling through because they are incredibly special. Thank you, Beth. Thank you, Liz. We're going to give everyone a couple of minutes to read this slide. Not really minutes, just a moment. And then we're going to dive into some of the meat, the information overload. We're going to start with an introduction by Anitra Cass. Anitra, do you want to take it away? Great. Thanks, Jack. So my name's Anitra Cass. I am the Southern California Regional Representative for PCTA. The southern region is 702 miles, the best miles, if you ask me, of the PCT, the most diverse. There's so much opportunity and so much diversity down there that I really think you're going to love it. But I start at the Mexican border, and I go 702 miles north to Kennedy Meadows, gateway to the High Sierra. And so what I do as a regional rep, I partner with our local agencies to oversee the actual trail that you're walking on, and the corridor that's around it. So those trail crews that you see out there are volunteers that you see out there doing trail maintenance. That's just one example of what I do in the coordination to maintain the trail for our users to enjoy. Let's hear from Jack. Okay, thanks a lot, Anitra. Here I am. I am multitasking, so I'm both running this presentation and I'm going to be talking about trail advice. Uh, I am Jack Haskell. My trail name is Found. I've worked at PCTA for five years, and it's an honor. I through hiked the trail in 2006. These days, I answer the phones and emails. I work on information projects, everything from oh, some trail signage stuff and looking at books that are being published to our social media and our website. Um, and then I do a lot of things that just help you all get out on the trail, um, so issuing permits, and uh, working on access issues, uh, getting you all inspired, helping you on your journey. Um, I'm a passionate backpacker, and I get to work for the Pacific Crest Trail Association day in, day out to make this experience a little bit better and, and to ensure that you have a great experience as well. Um, so it's a great time. Uh, we are going to pass it back to Anitra to talk about walking across the desert. Great. Thanks, Jack. So you are walking across the desert. So I hiked the trail in 2005, and the year I hiked, it had been a really, really crazy winter and a super wet spring. And I still had long, dry, waterless stretches to contend with. So please make sure that you carry enough water to get from one reliable source to the next. The PCTwater.com website is really essential in helping you study and plan where those reliable water sources are. They also have put out a really insightful webinar that when you get a chance, you should really take a look at. Um, never rely on... bringing that up. Uh, are we good? on people's screens sometime soon. They can, you can click on it. Um, just a little note of process. It looks like we have 308 people watching right now, which is wonderful. We're happy to have you all here. Great. Thanks, Jack. So definitely not right now because you're hanging out with us, but when you get some time, check out that webinar. So water caches. You guys know there are water caches out there, people that have 
put water on the trail for for trail users in an emergency these can prove really helpful but please 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 do not rely on them I do however recommend that you give yourself a safety net carry paper maps the importance of paper maps cannot be stressed enough it really can show you additional resources, springs, roads, different ways to get around to access water sources that might be outside of what is typically considered the trail corridor. And these can be really, really critical in helping you get the water you need to have a comfortable and safe trip across the desert. Thank you, Anitra. So we've actually touched on a couple of questions already. Uh, somebody asked um, whether they can find the water caches anywhere. The question is from Yoseki. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced your name. What is the best way to find out where water caches are coming up on the trail, particularly between mile zero and mile 652? Um, Nature, do you want to talk a little bit more about that? Well, again, I would certainly stress that folks should not rely on water caches. Uh, there are some water caches if people are planning like for an emergency purposes that they want to have all the resources available to them. Uh, I do believe that the water caches uh, can are noted on that pctwater.com report. Uh, and then sometimes there are just water caches that show up uh, unannounced. I and I hear your dog barking. Yes. <laughs> uh, we apologize for that from everybody to everybody. Uh, so the water caches generally are not actually on the water report at pctwater.com, and that's for a pretty good reason. Uh, these water caches are not big enough for everybody to be using for convenience. So when I threw hiked, there was only a couple of hundred people out. And uh, I know that lots of people were taking two liters, three liters, a whole gallon of water out of a water cache. And nowadays, um, they're just isn't, they're not developed to that size. Um, so it's best to not even know where they are so that you are walking between reliable water sources. And then the other piece of information um, that I like to share is just because you feel like you need to walk 25 miles down the PCT to get to the next water source, if it's an emergency, you probably don't need to go all that way. You really should, at that point, be looking at your paper maps and seeing what the bailout point is. So if you're in trouble, generally speaking, you can get to a road much quicker than walking all the way down the PCT to the next town. You can bail off the big mountain crest down into the desert and go to a road. And that's what you should do in an emergency as opposed to relying on this kind of random act of volunteers that are unofficially bringing out water just in case you need it. I'm going to go back to the slides. Um, so this is where I jump in. I am a wilderness first responder, and I think that Anitra and Beth also have some wilderness um, first aid training, and I hope that you all do too. At this point, if you haven't yet taken a wilderness first aid class and you're taking off really soon, my recommendations are to, to read some books about the topic. Um, there is real risk to long distance hiking on the PCT. Uh, people get in serious trouble. It, it's happened already this year. Um, if you are in serious trouble, you should call 911. Um, that is the best way to go about it. Generally, uh, rescues are initiated by the local sheriff. Um, so some of the incidents that have happened this year um, have been more about uh, people falling on ice or snow in Southern California. And in previous years, we've definitely seen problems with people not carrying enough water, so dehydration. Um, and then also hyponatremia, where they're, they get the message that drink water, drink water, drink water, and they're drinking too much water. And that can create a salt imbalance. So when you have these symptoms that are 
oh, sweaty, um, very disoriented. Um, you, it seems like the person might be overheating. The problem is, is it could be both too hot, which is a life threat, and it can also be um, not enough salt intake. So you really want to balance making sure you're eating and drinking plenty. Um, and make sure that when you, if you encounter somebody that's in trouble, take it very seriously and cool them off immediately. And until you've asked them questions like, how much have you been drinking? How much have you been eating? How much have you been urinating? You really can't tell whether it's hyponatremia, the low salt, or whether it's heat stroke or heat illness. Um, so cool them off, get their pertinent medical history, and be very cautious about it. Thank you, and I'm seeing a lot more questions coming in. Um, so that whole plug of being safe, I, I want to emphasize again, um, I am scared every time we get a phone call that somebody is in trouble. Uh, I, I tend to talk about seven liters of water as necessary. Um, you'll see online that lots of people are cavalier and they say oh, you just need four liters of water to do 30 miles per day. Uh, what I've learned in speaking with all of you over the years is that not everyone has the same physical fitness. Not everyone has the same um, pack weight or hikes the same miles per day. Um, so I put a question mark with this seven liters. It really does depend on how hot it is that day, whether you're going to be spending a night out or doing the whole waterless stretch in one go. Um, these are all very important things to figure so that you can get to your own personal right number for your own body, for your own experience, and your risk tolerance. Uh, Nitra, you have most of the long dry stretches, but not all of them, right? So do you remember how many dry stretches that we have that are 25 miles or more on the trail? Uh, well, depending on, on how the water is flowing that year, there are at least five per 25 or more mile stretches that, uh, that we have. Yeah. Great. Um, so we got a, we got a contribution from Double Tap, who is, um, one of the guys behind the PCT water report, and he's clarifying that they only report on the third gate water cache, which is the largest water cache on the trail, and it's north of Scissors Crossing, about mile 80 or so. So there's that answer for, are the water reports known? And we have a question from Jeff, and he's asking about the lake fire closure. Uh, so we have a slide about the closures, and let's dive right into that. Great. Thanks, Jack. So, yes, there are some closures on the PCT in Southern California. These are the ones that are currently closed and that we anticipate being closed uh, during the hiking season. Of course, at any time, depending on, on things that may happen, uh, this could change. But currently, the mountain fire, so just south of the town of Idlewild, uh, there is the same closure that was in place for the 2015 hiking season is still in place. Also, uh, as was just asked about, the lake fire. So the lake fire closure area is north of Interstate 10, so north of Ziggy and the Bear, uh, as you would head into Whitewater Canyon. Uh, it's closed all the way up to, in, to the Big Bear area, up near Onyx Peak and Onyx Summit. Um, it is still closed. There is no good alternate around that. It is a very large closure due to the lack of trails in that area being in the wilderness. Um, we are working with the forest to try to come up with some, some changes to this, but right now I don't have any real good answers for you other than that it is closed and there is not a good alternate right now. Um, we also have an endangered species closure on the Angeles National Forest, so 
above Los Angeles where the trail starts to go east-west down here in the first of the big bends that you will run into on this trail. Um, we do have an alternate around this. The alternate passes through some incredibly beautiful scenery uh, through Devil's Punch Bowl and uh, down the South Fork Trail. However, the trail is not to the standard PCT standard because it's not actually the PCT. It's a side trail that's being utilized to get around a closed area right now. So please know that if you do choose to hike that, it is not to PCT standard. If you are an equestrian, it's not an equestrian trail. And so our best um, um, ideas for you would be to trailer or shuttle your animal around that. Uh, there's also in the past been people that have been hiking along Highway 2, the Angeles Crest Highway. That is really, really dangerous. There is high-speed traffic going on that road in a windy mountain road, and it's very dangerous, and I really urge you not to utilize Highway 2 as your alternate route. The final closure is the Powerhouse Fire Closure. This is north of Green Valley and Casa de Luna or the Andersons. Um, there is a walk around there uh, that has partly is partly paved road walk, and then eventually it gets you onto some forest service roads, some dirt roads, and back onto the PCT. So I know you're probably thinking, okay, what if things change? Where do I get more information? Well, lucky for you, the website is listed here on the slide. If alternates change or if more closures happen to be put in place, we will update these pages and get that information out to you. Uh, yeah, and you can also check out the Forest Service or National Park Service or State Park websites. Uh, the PCT crosses lots of different jurisdictional boundaries. And they will also have things like official closure orders and we work with them, we talk to them on the phone and email um, to help clarify it so that it makes more sense for long distance users using half mile mileage. Um, we'll write a little bit more of like an explanation about where the closure boundary is, maybe make a couple of more maps. Um, and I, I'm speaking about future closures because closures do happen um, every summer. Uh, lots of acreage in the western United States burns while well, in the world there's lots of wildfires and we all should anticipate that some of the forests on the PCT will close this year because of wildfires. Maybe they will affect your experience on the PCT. Maybe you're, you're already going to be north of them. Don't really know. Beth, I was wondering if I could get you in to talk a little bit about uh, how the closure process works, because you're, you're from the Forest Service. Sure. So um, the reason that we close areas of land is because of some kind of resource problem or danger. And so folks need to know that if you see a sign that says closed, it may not be immediately evident to you what the risk is, but it's there for a purpose. And uh, we are very anxious to get the PCT back open. And so after four years of drought for most of the fire closures, you need to know that the fires that we've had have been very severe in intensity. And that intensity has left um, parts of the trail actually completely obliterated. So they're gone. And what has happened is it's burned. It's burned all the way through, down through the tree roots. The, um, the trail tread is gone. And then the other thing that happens is that we have winter rains that are pretty heavy in intensity. And so um, so know that it's not a simple, we'll just cheat the closure. There's a reason behind it. I did want to give a little bit more information about the endangered species closure on the Angeles National Forest, because that's unique along the full length of the trail. We have an endangered frog that uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is very concerned, and our biologists are concerned as well, about its habitat. It's one of the few places that have survived fire um, that the habitat's still intact. And so even though it may seem simple to just go through that closure, know that there is a really good reason behind it. So I think that's 
pretty much the essence of closures. There is a, a law enforcement side to this, but what I want you all to be taking with you is that there's also a natural resource concern that uh, you are helping to steward by choosing to comply. Thank you, Beth. Uh, I think the last point that I'll make about closures is when there's a new closure because of a wildfire, sometimes it's a rapidly changing situation. Um, so if you are caught up in a wildfire um, situation, it might take 24 hours or 48 hours before all of the information is known. So be responsible for your own safety and give it a little bit of time so that um, stuff can be signed and alternates, if available, can be um, discovered and posted online. So Jack, this is Beth again, just real quickly, because I think that's a really great point, is that you all, as you're in the woods, are the best people to know what's going on. And so if something seems wrong, if you see a big plume of fire, don't assume that somebody's going to come find you. You really need to take responsibility for your own safety. And um, especially in those emerging situations, there's a lot of complexity to closing roads, closing trails, and evacuating folks. And, um, and really, you shouldn't have the um, the through hike be the thing that's so important that you miss those first warning signs. Thank you, Beth. And thanks for talking about the endangered species because we are going to jump into campsite impacts. Um, this is something that uh, is a hard issue to grapple with. And, and really, it um, it gets to all of your experience on the PCT and what kind of um, patterns you use for choosing a campsite at night. Uh, I know that when I threw hiked the PCT, I was often just totally knackered at the end of the day. Um, I did not walk want to walk another mile after 25 miles or whatever my daily goal was. Um, and now that there's more people out using the trail, we're seeing more and more campsites that are far too close to the trail. Um, it's almost a badge of honor for some people to sleep directly on top of the PCT or to pitch their tent um, just a foot off the trail. And I, I think that that's too bad because it creates this denuded strip of dead vegetation and obvious human impact up and down the trail. So I, I really want to encourage everybody to go far enough off the trail. And then how this relates to endangered species and sensitive plants, um, especially in, if, if you think about Southern California and everyone, a lot of people are camping next to water sources. Well, wildlife is also using those um, water sources. And there are um, issues with sensitive animals, toads, birds, rare plants, and other, and other animals up and down the PCT. Um, and they can really be harmed by uh, everyone creating larger campsites or irresponsible campsites in places where they didn't already exist. Um, so I, I was hoping that we could get Anitra to chime in a little bit. You've got some through hiking experience, just like me. Um, what do you like to do when, when you're thinking about pitching a tent for the night? Well, so one of the things I probably do is the night before I pull out my maps and I will look at my maps and I will look at the contour lines and figure out what's a distance, X number of miles, the approximate distance I would like to go. And I will look for areas that have contour lines that are maybe farther apart so that I can tell that maybe that area is flattish. And so that might be a good location for me to start looking for campsites that night. So really my campsite planning starts the night before when I'm winding down from the evening and sitting in my, in my sleeping bag. And so that way the next day, I have a goal of where I'm going to go, and once I get to that area that looks flat, I try to get out of sight of the trail as best as I can. 
and try really hard, unless it's an emergency, to not camp within sight of the trail. And so that's really how I go about it. It starts with planning the night before, or at least it always has with me. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of dry camping. Um, I, th I think that I can find the nicest places, the best views, the least impact. I love the challenge of being able to find a spot that nobody has ever used before and then leaving it in a, in a condition so that it, the next person can sleep in that same spot and feel like nobody has ever used this spot before. Um, that's, that's a big part of the wilderness experience. That's why I go out on the trail. So, yep, that plug for not just camping at the campsites, the little green icons on the maps, um, choosing your own adventure, going out, exploring the wilderness, finding a pristine, durable place to pitch my tent. And, Jack, I just want to jump in a little bit. You were talking about dry camping. One of the really successful methods that I used was hiking, I would get to a water source, I might make my dinner there, and then I would hike on for another few miles in the cooler evening air in Southern California. And so I think that uh, certainly on the PCT, kind of redefining that paradigm of what you need and want for camp and what your hiking day looks like uh, is really, uh, I don't know, I guess it would be kind of standard for Western hiking is kind of redefining that and figuring out how you can make it work and really utilize those cooler hours of the day to do your hiking. And of course, utilizing the calories that you just ate at dinner before you finished doing some more hiking that evening. Okay. Fire safety, this is almost the reason for doing this webinar. Um, it is so important. Uh, Anitra, take it away. So let's be honest. Southern California is a tinderbox. It is very dry here, and the combination of grasses and uh, deadfall, fire suppression, etc., over the years has really, really conspired to make California a tinderbox. So my recommendation: avoid having campfires. They're basically not allowed. Um, there are a few areas, certain campgrounds that you, with the metal fire rings, like designated actual campgrounds, where you can have a fire. But at certain times of the year, you can't even have a fire there. Uh, for example, if it's really windy and there are red flag warnings. Uh, throughout the year, as it gets drier and drier, some of those campgrounds with the metal rings uh, have a campfire ban there as well. So uh, campfire bans are likely. They will happen. And in some of those cases, alcohol stoves could be banned as well. And so uh, up on the screen, you'll see that there are some kind of commitments that we would really like people to take to heart. Um, using only those existing metal fire rings. Having fires only where they are legal. Uh, really making sure that you protect the resource, protect the trees, protect the vegetation uh, when they're rare, for example, at high elevation trees. Um, if you are going to have a fire in, in a campground in an area where it is legal, making sure that you're using already uh, dead and downed detached small diameter wood. And of course, Leave those axes, hatchets, and saws at home. Not only do you not need them, but they're really going to be heavy in your pack. So again, I really implore you to take fire safety seriously and again, kind of changing your paradigm about how you hike and the, the rituals you've had on your hikes. I know um, when I first started hiking, backpacking in New Jersey, my dad and I, we would hike our six miles with our really big packs, and each night we would have this beautiful campfire. And uh, hiking out west, I've really had to redefine what, what in camp means to me. And I think it's for the betterment of my hiking, but also for protecting the environment and the resource. Great, thank you. Uh, so we got a question. Um, I used a term that people weren't familiar with. It is, what is way, what do I mean by waypoint hopping? 
Um, and there's also another question about maps, so I'm going to address both of them at the same time. Uh, waypoint hopping is a, a waypoint is a point um, on a GPS or on a map that has a feature. It's a campsite, it's a water source, it's a picnic table, it's a road crossing. And previously, maps um, that the Forest Service produced or USGS produced didn't have those features on it. Um, but nowadays, especially with crowdsourced mapping, which is wonderful in Gut Hook and Half Mile um, and, and other map makers, they have pretty much most of the locations featured on the maps. And then a lot of people just use their smartphones. Um, and might not even be looking at a map at all, um, and they're just looking at those waypoints. Well, it turns out that the world is much richer than whatever those waypoints are. So the campsites that are listed on your phone or on the paper map, like in the background, um, are a limited picture of the total possibilities. Um, so if you look at your map and you look at the topography on a topo map, you can see flat areas, you can see creeks that aren't right directly on the PCT. You can see a whole lot of different things and that's part of the richness of your PCT hike is the ability to, to use um, old skills, uh, skills that aren't used every day in cities like reading maps, um, choosing your own adventure, not hopping between the waypoints and when everyone hops between the waypoints, that's when we end up with the 50 people that left the Mexican border on one day, they all go to the next waypoint, and then they all go to the next waypoint, and the campsites are very heavy, or heavily used and heavily impacted, and it's more, more jeopardy towards um, endangered species, quality of your experience, things like that. The other map question is, um, do I need to carry paper maps? Uh, I know it's not ideal if I don't. Um, and how well signed is the trail? Well, the, the trail is pretty well signed to the standard that it's supposed to be signed to, which is a pretty minimal amount of signage. The, the vision for the trail is that you go out and you have this primitive wild experience. Um, so it's not signed everywhere with every direction, but intersections should be signed um, and occasional reassurance markers, the PCT reassurance service mark, um, to help you with navigation. But really, written into the vision of this thing is this is a place to use maps. Um, so I'm really going to strongly encourage you to, to practice those skills and I think that it's most important to have maps during emergencies. Um, it's when stuff goes wrong, like my screen broke, or my phone is dead, or I fell in a creek, or it's nighttime and my hiking companion has just been bit by a bee, stung by a bee, and has an emergency. And that's when I need to look at side trails to evacuate or I'm lost and I need to look at paper maps because I'm lost and it's a real challenge. And it's the exact wrong time to not have paper maps with you. So even if you're going to carry them and almost never use them, I think you should still carry them. It enriches your experience. It expands your knowledge about your PCT hike. Um, big, strong plugs for paper maps. Great question. Leave no trace in towns. Uh, this first one, may I have a plug, please? Um, this, uh, this was introduced to me just last year. Uh, Mount Laguna is about mile 40 on the Pacific Crest Trail, and it's a small place with just a couple of businesses, and they love all of you long-distance hikers. Um, and they their facilities weren't built for everyone having smartphones and digital cameras and um, Kindles to plug in. So with lots of hikers showing up every day, um, the restaurants, the stores had a lot of pressure on hikers feeling entitled 
to charge their devices. Um, and that's, that's the case all the way up and down the PCT, that uh, don't expect to sit in a restaurant for six and a half hours while 30 through hikers want to charge their cell phone. Um, if you do want to charge your cell phone in town, um, that's a service that businesses can provide or not. Um, and if, if you want to do it, get a hotel room. Um, this all kind of fits into this idea of just being nice and sustainable in town. Uh, just as we commit to leaving no trace out on the trail, um, try to be nice to everybody and minimum impact when you're talking with trail angels, when you're talking with business owners, and everyone else that you meet on the PCT. You are ambassadors. Um, Beth, you have some long distance hiking experience. Uh, what was it like um, on the Appalachian Trail when you were in town? Did you see any hiker town conflicts? Well, you know, Jack, that was a long time ago. So we're talking 1987. So the volume of use was, a, well, 85, I'm sorry, is when I summited Katahdin. Um, but I'm thinking to my PCT hikes as well. And in 1991, which is when I started at the Mexican border, um, you know, there just weren't that many people. And so I'm reflecting as we've had this conversation today that part of the tension is because of the numbers of people and numbers of hikers. And so as you all take your journey, really keeping the door open so that others can have similar experiences and benefit from whether it be trail angels or good Samaritans and towns and businesses and not have those doors closed because of bad behavior or just simply from um, being overwhelmed, the communities being overwhelmed. Um, through hikers and PCT enthusiasts are um, bringing a good recre outdoor recreation economy into towns. You're helping them survive through some thin times, but it also can be a real um, stress to the small communities. And so um, I also, in thinking back, Jack, in terms of other experiences in towns, um, know that that's also a place you need to be extra um, smart in terms of your own personal safety and um, not getting into conflict, not if you're traveling by yourself, not... Yeah, um, I have a slide flying. about that, Beth. I'll, I'll okay. be talking about that for sure. All right. Did that hit what you were wanting me to talk yeah. about? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for chiming in there. Um, the, the last piece that I would kind of mention is um, ask hotel owners whether it's okay to add more people to your room. Um, almost all of them are extremely generous. They're giving PCT hikers discounts. They're tolerating a really stressful month. They love your business. And fitting seven people into a room causes more of, more of a mess um, and more damage. So um, just make sure that you extend that courtesy to hotel owners if, if you do plan on cramming seven people into a hotel room. We hear that a lot. So um, jumping on to the human factor safety, we've talked a little bit about some of the risks in wild areas. Um, I want to put a plug in for this PCTA.org slash safety. There's a lot of good information on there about um, that the trail is not insulated from problems of society. That uh, Trail angels is, it's a very informal term. Um, anyone can call themselves a trail angel. They are generally absolutely wonderful people, um, but we don't know everyone on the trail. There's no vetting system. Um, and be safe. If, if somebody is coming off as a little off to you, maybe they're drunk or it's just something's not right, um, go ahead and leave that situation. Uh, don't continue exposing yourself to risk. Does that make sense? Um, for more detail, please do read our website. Snow woes. Uh, we have a couple of questions about snow travel, so I'm going to scan them and read them off. 
One question is, how is the snowpack expected to be in the Sierra come early June? And we have a question about the need to carry um, snow safety devices like crampons, ice axe, whippets, micro spikes, things like that. Okay. Uh, Jack has this nice graph uh, down here about the eight percent of April first average, but it was when we created the slide. It was March twenty third. I would say that generally it's higher than previous year's snowpack, um, not as high as other years. And to be honest, it doesn't really matter what the snowpack is right now. It only matters when you get there. And so only the weather will really tell us what the snowpack looks like when you are headed out into the, into the field and on your hike. Um, the snowpack does lead to kind of two kind of issues. Um, snow travel, right, which can lead to serious falls on steep slopes, um, twisted knees or legs and potentially broken bones from post holing from that walking on the snow and then falling through. Um, on my hike in 2005 I mentioned that it was a pretty intense winter prior to my hike and then a pretty intense spring as well. And so I had those post holing twists and scrapes that happened to me for sure. But I think that to me anyway the danger that I overlooked uh, and that was seriously ramped up by a higher snowpack was actually the creek crossings. So if you have a lot of snow and if things melt off fast you can have higher than normal creek crossings and so flooding creeks are a real danger. Um, I know a lot of people say that oh I'll just cross on logs and although that can be great sometimes they can also lead to a false sense of safety they can be slippery you can get your foot caught or tangled in logs and you can end up in the water that way so on my 2005 hike I actually had a very close call with drowning uh, in the Sierra um, I did the right things. I found a uh, not spot on the trail. I went upstream a little bit to an area that looked calmer, that looked like I'd be able to handle it. I was crossing with friends. We had our hip belts off. We were watching each other. We were doing these right things. And I still managed to find myself under the water. Um, getting under the water instantly restricts your brain, brain's ability to function because basically it's all snow melt. It's like dunking yourself in an ice bath but not being able to get yourself up. Um, so the creek crossings is something that I overlooked and I'm very confident in water. Uh, I was a lifeguard and collegiate athlete, diver, so I feel really comfortable in the water, but this was something that was just beyond anything I could imagine. So please, please, please take the creek crossings as seriously as the snow traverses. If you are going in a group, please make sure that you have your whole group before you're going to go across that creek. Don't leave anybody behind, much like if you're hiking in a group. People wait at intersections with other trails so that they make sure that their whole group makes the same turns. So don't let people in your group cross alone. It's really, really important. Um, I know, Jack, you asked also, there was a question about snow gear. I would say, uh, at least from my perspective, and of course the Sierra is, is not my home turf, but I have spent a, a fair bit of time there, that um, bring gear that you know how to use, bring gear that you have practiced with, um, and bring gear that is appropriate for the conditions that you are going to see when your itinerary gets you there based on what the weather is doing, what the snowpack's doing, what the melt is doing. And that answer is going to vary for everybody. Thanks, Anitra. Um, so Maggie's question is very specific about snowpack in early June and snowpack around Tahoe in early June. Um, the, the problem with answering this is we don't really know. It, it depends on when the last snow happens. Um, so will it continue snowing late in the year? And then how warm will spring be? And then also there's this period of snow melt 
where um, danger remains in very focused specific locations. Um, so if you are, say, on Dix Pass in Desolation Wilderness and you have low risk tolerance and there is any amount of snow, um, which is likely throughout the entire month of June that there will be snow on Dix Pass, um, it can present a real risk and it's something that you might not want to do. And that's when I always recommend you have maps so you can know ways to go around if they exist and that you also have enough food in your backpack so that you can have options and turn around, um, hike back to the trailhead if you get to a really steep snow slope and it's not acceptable for you. Beth, wildlife, we're gonna have to speed things up everybody. We have lots of questions. There's more than 300 of you. Hi guys, so I talked with the wildlife biologists at Yosemite knowing that you would much rather really hear from a true bear biologist than from me substituting. So know that they had some very specific words and requests for you. Um, throughout the Sierras and especially between Kennedy Meadows and Sonora Pass, food storage and bear food storage is a really important concern. There are regulations about it because we've had so much trouble with bears being habituated to uh, human food and humans. And so they asked me to tell you three things. The first thing is we have bears in the daytime. So remember food storage includes during the daytime you need to have your food secured. You must be within six feet of it and awake even during the daytime. Um, so think about bears in the daytime. Don't stash your pack and go do something. Um, make sure that your um, food does fit in the bear canister, all of it, all of your food, and all of your toiletries. So the time to figure out how to store that is not when, once you get the resupply, it's before you even take your trip. Understand how you're going to have to compact things. And then the last thing that they were uh, really wanting to be sure that you knew is that um, the parks and forests have very specific requirements about what type of food storage. And so the best way to um, find out that information is to go onto the Sierra Bear .gov or Sierra Wild .gov website and from that you can see what type of canisters are allowed in Yosemite, what type of canisters are allowed in Sequoia Kings Canyon, and then the other specific forest recommendations. Um, so I think to keep it short that's that's the highlights but know that as you travel through this place being able to see a bear is a really fabulous opportunity. It's really unique. It's part of your experience. If we habituate bears to human food by um, kind of casually camping with your food or not very thoughtfully hanging your food versus complying with the bear canister requirements, which ensure that the bear itself will be protected, it really changes over time the experience of others. Back to you, Jack. Thank you, Beth. Okay. Yeah, Nitra, I gave you a dirty toilet paper to talk about. Sorry. Excellent. <laughs> One of my favorite topics. Okay, uh, before I talk about poop, I do want to also mention that there are bears in Southern California. Uh, and I get more and more sightings reported to me, so don't think bears are limited to the Sierra. We have them in Southern California, so protect your food here as well. Uh, okay, poop. I told you earlier that I one of the things I do is coordinate trail crews to do work, and now I'm going to tell you that you need to dispose of your waste properly. There is virtually nothing more off-putting to new hikers and my trail crew workers and volunteers alike than trying to find a lunch spot, but everywhere it's littered with toilet paper. Or when the crew is moving rocks to do trail maintenance uh, on the trail and they stick their hand right into human feces because somebody decided they were going to use the rock and roll method. They didn't bring a shovel or a trowel, so instead they just moved a rock in that hole that the rock was sitting in, they deposited their human waste, and then they plopped the rock back on top of it. 
That is called the rock and roll method. And I implore you not to do it. So what should you do? Defecate far away from campsites and lunch spots, water and the trail. Bury it properly with a shovel or trail and carry out toilet paper. Do not use the rock and roll method. Poop. Poop. Okay, those dang Sharpies. Uh, I, I don't think that any of you that are who are watching this would tag the trail, um, but other people do, and it's really unfortunate. Um, it's a waste of resources. Uh, it's largely, there's sort of two types, some that's like, helpful and well three types and some that's humorous and some that is just graffiti vandalism um, and I'm convinced that it's it's all vandalism um, if if you want to improve the signage on the trail uh, sign up and volunteer there's there's thousand sixteen hundred Pacific Crest Trail volunteers by and large, the Pacific Crest Trail Association is not the three of us that you're watching. Um, it is you all as volunteers and donors. Um, so it, it would be fantastic to have those volunteers spending their time out rehabilitating burn areas, out improving signage, out clearing logs off the trail, out introducing the PCT to young people um, but resources every year are sucked up because of just straight vandalism. And it is because of those felt tip pens. Um, last year, there was a long distance hiker that uh, wrote on every sign for something like 100 miles, um, a little joke on every, every single sign. Um, it wasn't funny, not at all. Uh, we, we go out to the PCT, to nature, um, to escape, to have a break from all of society's distractions and all these other good reasons. And I view people's writing on signs as it, it just kind of grabs my attention and takes me out of this blissful, natural state. So quit it with the Sharpies. Um, it really stinks. Crest Runners, we have three of them this year. I just learned that, Beth. That is fantastic. It is fantastic. And um, Brandon and Jules will be full-time. And Greg, some of you may know from last year. So he actually got a permanent job on the Cleveland National Forest. And so he'll be working with Jules and Brandon as well to um, do a couple of things. One, um, they want your trip to be successful. And so they are, um, Greg and Jules are both through hikers. They are, um, their assignment, all three assignment is to work from the southern terminus for the first 110 miles to Warner Springs. And they'll be traveling up and down the trail. They'll be talking to you about Leave No Trace if you want to have a conversation about that. So if you have questions, You'll know them. They'll be in uniform. And if you, um, the other thing that they'll be doing is they'll be helping us monitor some of the water sources and campsites and to make sure that we're minimizing impacts to the trail. So they're leave no trace experts. They know a ton of things about the PCT, and we are really delighted to have them helping us take care of the trail. Thank you, Beth. Uh, we have uh, basically the last slide coming up, and it is how we are different from the Appalachian Trail. Uh, in, in a lot of ways we are. We're also pretty similar. The AT, they're um, good friends of ours. They're a fellow National Scenic Trail. Um, somebody just turned out the lights in the whole building, so I apologize for that. Uh, and I I, I do. We bring this up because I know that uh, a large percentage of you, maybe it's 20%, just a guess, um, are coming from uh, a background where you're an AT hiker, whether you're a through hiker or a section hiker, and you're coming out to the PCT. Um, there's a couple of big differences. 
Uh, some of it's written into the visions behind these trails. Um, the PCT is not signed as heavily as the white blazes on the Appalachian Trail. And then one of the stark differences for northbounders who are starting at the Mexican border is that you're walking through the desert right at the beginning. So um, it's more ambitious, uh, higher miles per day, necessitated because there's a lack of water. Um, and also it's, uh, in some ways, the campsite experience is different. On the AT, people gather in shelters and have big campfires. On the PCT, we really want to emphasize that the mountains above San Diego are not a place to have a campfire. Um, so you AT, AT hikers will, will probably miss that. Um, and then this is also just a, a more remote experience. About half of the trail is federally designated wilderness. Um, and you're on your own. There are fewer road crossings, fewer trail angels coming out to lend a hand um, and know those things. Uh, Anitra, we, all four of us have AT hiking experience. Um, so we're, we're speaking from that experience and I think that's all we really need to say unless somebody wants to chime in with more about this. Nope, okay. So, um, thank you for your support. We're going to ask, we're going to go through questions, and I'm going to let Liz and Beth talk a little bit more right now. Okay, well, I would just like to say thank you all for joining us today. Thanks to uh, Jack, Anitra, and Beth for pulling this together. Um, we are all part of the PCT community. You are all part of the PCT community, and your support makes this experience possible. So we hope that you have a, a fabulous time. And I know that we're going to have some time here for questions in just a couple minutes. And I'd like to also congratulate you for this opportunity and for PCTA. Thanks for your support, um, protecting and preserving and promoting the trail is a really important thing to make sure that future generations get this opportunity. And so while we've shared a lot of information to, to give you a snapshot of the trail, know that there were 96,000 hours volunteered to support the trail last year by PCTA volunteers. And so as you take your hike, if you see volunteers or if you see agency crews, tell them thank you. And when you're done with your hike, Think about how you can give back. Okay, thank you all. So we're going to dive into questions for five or 10 minutes. Um, we have a couple of them about campfire bans. One is, with a ban on camp stoves and fires, how should we heat water for our meals? Um, I'd like to point out, maybe we uh, were a little bit confusing, but it's very rare for all camp stoves to be banned. Um, that is during real crises. So generally, um, when a campfire is banned, um, your alcohol stoves might also be banned because they don't all they don't have a positive shutoff valve or a contained fuel source. So basically an alcohol stove, if you flip it over, it's going to leak fuel and you can't turn it off. Um, but stoves that you can turn off and they have a contained fuel source like a uh, jet boil or a canister stove, um, those are usually not banned. Um, so you can still cook. Uh, it's, it's only the real extreme fire bans that sometimes happen in Southern California more later in the season where all stoves are banned. And then basically the answer is you can't heat water. Um, it's just not possible. Um, we've got a question about stealth camping. Uh, this is more of a suggestion. What about hiking back to the trail and camping for a bit? Basically just have a Nero day. How feasible is this in most towns or as a general strategy? Anitra, can you speak to that one? Stealth camping versus going back to the PCT to find a spot to camp. Yeah, so um, 
there are probably some camping options in town that are legal. There are also some stealth camping options in town that are not legal. Uh, on, on one of our slides we talked about, you know, uh, like in certain parks and different areas, really find out whether you can stealth camp legally somewhere in town. Otherwise, I would say, yeah, go back to the trail. In some cases, the trail's really close to a town, and so finding an appropriate campsite on or near the trail, I should say, is a great option. I think when you're planning, you can plan Nero's pretty easily. You know, just have hike a couple miles into town that day, um, and then maybe just a couple miles out. And so, with a little bit of planning uh, on your schedule and looking at maps ahead of time, you can really plan some some good Nero days if that's the route that you'd like to go. But I definitely think planning to camp on trail um, is probably the way to go with that. Yeah, I, I think that's a great option. Um, it's free. Uh, you can have the relaxing time in town, get a restaurant meal, do your laundry, go back to the PCT to camp. The one thing to, to know is that uh, some places on the PCT you can't camp. Um, like if you are directly on the boundary of a campground, um, you can't just set up your tent right on the outside of a campground. So when you're thinking about going back to the PCT from town, um, you should think about having to hike a little bit, not very far, but oftentimes right around an interstate, that's a no camping area. Then you can't just camp underneath the interstate legally just because it's the Pacific Crest Trail, or maybe there's people's vacation homes around the road, things like that. You need to make sure that you're deep enough into Forest Service land or Bureau of Land Management land um, so that you can camp. That's a great question. Um, there is a question about how are red flag warnings communicated? Ooh, not I can so... help you, Jack. Oh, yes, please. So this is Beth. Um, red flag warnings are, are actually on the news, right? So they talk about them that way. So it's a combination of dryness, lack of precipitation, and wind. And so you know if the wind is picking up and it's really dry, you should be thinking that the fire danger is going up. Um, so PCDA, I don't think, publishes red flag warnings. But uh, you could certainly get that if you had access to something that was giving you weather. Um, the other thing to know is just it's that combination of dryness, wind, and lack of precipitation that really creates the environment for a red flag warning. Thank you. Um, and I think we're going to take two last questions. We're not going to be able to get to all your questions, but thanks for submitting them. Um, and there's a whole lot of questions that people want to know more about the snow situation. I, I think we've talked about this somewhat extensively, but we can go into it a little bit more. Um, if you are going to be in the Sierra Nevada with snow on the ground, so that's usually throughout the month of June into early July. In a normal year, we showed that snow survey graph we have links to that and other sources of information on our website. Um, you should be prepared for snow. And if, if you don't have the experience, the risk tolerance, the fitness, the equipment, the knowledge um, to safely go over big snowy passes, it very much is like mountaineering. Um, people, PCT hikers, get hurt. Um, you should consider delaying. Uh, it, it's not a, not a good thing to go out and do. Um, there's also snow in the mountains of Southern California, so mile 140-ish. Um, there's snow up on San Jacinto, but we're getting reports from people that are already out there that um, the snow is challenging, that it's there. We know that it's steep. And there's other places in Southern California, too, that have snow on the trail if you're out in early season. Um, so be safe with it. Uh, what else can we say? Um, we don't, I, again, we don't really know when it will melt off. Um, at 74% of normal 
that sort of means that it's going to be about a normal year, maybe a little bit less than normal. Um, June 15th, Ray Day, leaving north from Kennedy Meadows was traditionally like the earliest time. That'd be a good idea. You'll hear about lots of people that are going in way earlier season, um, but they might have substantial backcountry skiing experience. They might have, they might have climbed Everest, right? Um, your situation is not necessarily their situation. And if you're thinking about going in in April or May into the high Sierra, you should be a skier. Um, there is real risk, so be safe out there. Let's see, one last question. Um, how necessary are umbrellas for the southern desert section? Would a wide-brimmed hat be all right? This is a gear question. We don't often talk about gear. Um, Anitra, you've walked across the desert a couple of times, multiple different deserts. What's, what's your preferred um, sun gear for SoCal? It depends if you want to carry an umbrella or not. Um, I carried one in the New Mexico desert on my CDT hike, and I would say I used it most often as a uh, a privacy shade for the bathroom uh, versus an <laughs> umbrella for the sun. Um, so it really just depends on your style hiking. Is it necessary? No. Uh, would it be nice? There are definitely days where you would like to be able to make a little bit of shade or keep the sun off you. Um, so, again, it's a highly individual question, and I think if you like it, go for it. Yeah, I, I like umbrellas mostly when it's raining and not windy. <laughs> um, I don't use them all that much in the desert. Uh, I, I do think it's important to protect yourself from the sun, though, so wide-brim hat's a great option. Long sleeves are a great option. Um, you're going to be spending a long, long time out in the sun, really intense sun, so think about skin protection, skin cancer, if the umbrella is the right thing for you. I know that they're really popular. Um, I also know that you're going to get out there and you're going to realize that everyone has different equipment and that there's no right answer and there's no golden ticket when it comes to gear. Um, I do like the broad principle of not carrying a super heavy backpack, though. I have hey, a Jack. suggestion for that, Jack. Yeah. I mean, you might want to just try it out. If you think you're going to like to carry an umbrella, part of it is whether or not you like to hold it, right? So, yeah. I, yeah. And, right. and I would say try out your gear. I mean, if you use a wide berm hat, does it have a strap so when it gets windy it doesn't blow off your head? Does it hit the back of your backpack? So try that out. Try the umbrella out. See what works best in your gear system. Okay, we're going to wrap it up. Uh, we know that we um, captured all of your attention late after work. Um, so thank you so much for in joining us. Thank you for getting out and using the Pacific Crest Trail, for supporting the Pacific Crest Trail and the Pacific Crest Trail Association. This is a wild and crazy project, a trail that's 2,600 miles long. And it exists because you all love it. Um, so welcome to the trail. Have a great summer. Uh, get in contact with us. Give us a call. Send us an email. We really appreciate that you took the time to join us for this webinar. Goodbye. <laughs>